Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We are gathered here today to, uh, to, to discuss SIUT as a continuing center of excellence and, uh, and continuing expansion. So besides uh, the treatment of kidney disease, including transplantation, SIUT provides services in uh, digestive diseases, um, oncology, um, uh, etc. at a tertiary level. So therefore, uh, today, um, we are honored to have uh, the faculty from their digestive disease unit, which includes both surgeons and physicians. So we have Dr. Abdal Khan from uh, uh, the surgery division, along with Dr. Bushra Shirazi. And then we have uh, Dr. Nasir Lak, who is head of the gastrointestinal unit, and Dr. Abbas Tasneem and Dr. Heather Mehdi. And, uh, uh, and we also have uh, the director of the SIUT, Dr. Adib Rizvi, who needs no introduction whatsoever. Um, uh, Participating in the discussion is myself, Dr. Tariq Shakur. I'm a gastroenterologist in the United States. And uh, Dr. Irfan Rizvi, who is a colorectal surgeon in Washington, D.C. So I'll begin with Dr. Rizvi. Um, uh, Dr. Rizvi, Salaamu Alaikum. Uh, you um, you uh, had established this unit uh, from an eight-bedded unit, uh, which, was a, which was basically a urology unit which was an offshoot of the general surgery division at Civil Hospital Karachi. But then it evolved uh, over a period of time into an international center of kidney diseases and renal transplantation uh, with uh, regional fame. Um, uh, my, my, my question to you is, what made you uh, feel the need to... to, to to branch out into other facilities and other disciplines other than kidney disease and how you developed the idea of developing a center for uh, digestive diseases, which has now become a center of excellence in that region. It simply was my observation as a house surgeon when I was working here that uh, how much facility we have got and where we can take our patients when there are complications and when the other facilities are required. Here, when we opened, uh, came here and got a, a, a post to work in civil hospital with my, my alma mater, I noted that uh, uh, you have to fight for the patient and if you keep your eyes open then there were a lot of problems and if you keep your eyes closed there were no problem so uh, when you are seeing the patient you could easily go uh, when the time was over so let the patient die for the want of drips for the want of antibiotic for the want of bed and bed bath at that time, I was attached with the Burns unit. And uh, in the same way, uh, practice was to write the medicine to the patient or their relations to bring it, which was uh, very painful because most of the time, these patients or their relations, they had no way, but they used to beg, borrow, and sometimes they used to pawn off they are whatever uh, stuff they have bought on their body and then buy the medicine. So this was very painful. Maybe that I had poor state in it and it was after eight or nine years when I came to find a national health service. I went to America and there too I saw it was I didn't like that. The national health service was the best for me. When I came in my own country, the people used to begging uh, on the street with the prescription of the doctor that they have to buy this drug. So uh, we had no option. And in my background as a medical student, I was a member of Democratic Student Foundation 
a student organization which used to believe that uh, the free health, education, and employment is the birthright of every human being. So that we used to we actually uh, show attend the slogan. And here, when I was faced with the real problem, I was in a great fix what to do. And we used to get the list of the drugs which will be available that day. Nothing to do with the uh, disease. So in these circumstances, we started first collecting the medicine, whatever spare medicine was left over in somebody's Almira, in the uh, in my uh, family friends' home, we used to go and collect their medicine. Then uh, sometime we used to um, borrow some money or take the donation and go and buy the medicine. But that also became very painful because after some time, people started thinking that after all the time, I'm standing for the money. Is it? And then we thought that we should have something more. And then uh, actually, if we actually uh, uh, founded a philosophy that every human being, irrespective of cause, color, creed, has got a right to treatment, food, and education. And uh, uh, every question should get this medicine. Government is not able to, we used to say that it should be there. So we started, uh, I had very good friends and supporters. So we started with the bread sheets. Yes. Pillows. Yes. Med drinking water. And that's how we uh, created a, uh, actually a concept that uh, it is not the responsibility of government only to treat the patient, but it has to be public responsibility as well. And we performed it. And this is right that either factor of what flavor may be, but it is joint responsibility of public and uh, government to provide health care. So that we are following that it is a partnership between the government and the public to provide the health care for people. On that basis, we created all these institution buildings. Uh, the private sector has provided us facilities and government has provided us medicine. And where government is not able to provide us, we go to public aid and uh, we get the medicine. And uh, with the help of public, we develop a corpus. That corpus is there that even if today something happens and we have got no fund, we will run the institution at least for three years. Yes. So, institution economically, a solid and sound, it is uh, actually uh, uh, basically it is solid and sound and ethically it is solid and sound. The doctors who come to work uh, to a great extent and they are working voluntarily. The pay which they get is just to keep them going on and their family going on. No one is allowed to do the quiet practice. So uh, they are uh, actually in that way very much restricted that they can't do private practice and the pay is restricted and they have to be here 24 hours almost uh, when it is needed. So institute has been very lucky to get the people who molded themselves with the problem of the institute. Time, no limit of the time, uh, uh, money, just what institute can pay. And but one thing is there: any medicine, any instrument which is needed for the patient will always be available. They can write anything without thinking, and that will be provided by the institute. Not a penny, what medicine will be brought by the relations. 
no question that that is there and we have given a concept of people it is birth right of every human being irrespective of caste color creed or religious belief to access health care free with dignity and that what we that is our slogan that is our motto and that what are we are working for and uh, i don't uh, feel ashamed of uh, actually spreading my hand to anybody uh, for jum for charity for the institute well you certainly have a you certainly have a have a reputation uh where uh, where there's a lot of transparency in your institute and the money that you get from the public sector uh is is well utilized and nobody over the last uh, 40 years has had any doubt which is why you get uh, people are so willing to donate uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your expansion out of karachi and your facility uh, in uh, in kurangi and in sakkar uh, taking you back what you said that the three transparencies that in such a way that anybody can come and can check their account that is public yeah. nothing yes. yes that's that's the general belief in the city whenever i visit chen the reason why expansion was the karachi uh, is uh, far away from the interior of the sin interior of the punjab or baluchistan far away so we had an idea is we have got to open a center everywhere but till such time that we have got the facilities money and resources to open a center like this in every province we have to make ourselves available to the patients there and for that uh, we have succeeded in making two three uh, centers one in muzaffarabad kashmir and the center in now in hyderabad we are opening and a very a big center in sakkar but it is not uh, covering the all that which is required yes so we also have with us uh, dr irfan rizvi from washington dc he is a colorectal surgeon and he's familiar with the siut as well and uh, i'm going to uh, uh, have dr rizvi ask some questions of uh, his surgical colleagues at the siut Uh, Assalamu alaikum, uh, Dr. Tariq Shakur and, and friends. Uh, it's certainly an honor and a privilege to be amongst friends. Uh, and uh, Dr. Abdul, especially you and I go back a fairly long way. Uh, I was your student at AKU, and then I was your senior house officer in the UK. So, and of course, uh, you, you know, you've been here uh, at SIUT for. Uh, several years now and you've built up a remarkable program so uh, my my question to you sir is that uh, siut is known as a center for uh, renal diseases in general uh, and a place that does mostly kidney transplants uh, perhaps a lesser known facet of siut is its gastrointestinal or shall we say digestive diseases services could you give us some idea of the scope of your work in terms of the complexity of the operations you do and is it true that in some situations uh siut your your unit functions as a quaternary referral center for complex hepatobiliary surgeries uh in karachi dr uh, yes. abdal please yes sir fan it is nice to see your face again after a long time uh and i am glad that you're doing so well uh, in colorectal and general surgery uh we started with a general surgical program with hepatobiliary interest uh we provide acute care service to these very sick dialysis and trans kidney transplant patients they keep coming in with general surgical problems skin and soft tissue infections bowel obstructions perforations and this is the general acute care that we provide we are also referred by the rest of the city uh, especially the uh, uh, the government sector hospitals which have a sick patient with a high urea or creatinine and has a surgical problem so they will just bundle these patients to siut rather than just hydrate them 
and look after them. So we also take care of these patients who come back to SIUT with uh, high urea uh, from probably sepsis, dehydration, or whatever the cause. Uh, some gynae operations are, are also, uh, you know, end up with SIUT when they have a high urea and creatinine or some surgical problem. The other uh, aspect is uh, our elective work uh, that comes through our OPD. Uh, we have a hepatobiliary and general surgery clinic, a colorectal clinic, and a breast clinic. And these function independently. And also, uh, we look after these complex hepatobiliary issues like bile duct injuries we see very frequently because of some problems in training in the uh, the people who are practicing, but also because the, 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 the patients themselves, they keep getting antibiotics and they keep getting inflammations. And so by the time they come for surgery, it is already uh, advanced, uh, stuck, planned all over the place. And so many surgeons, even if they are very uh, adept at doing laparoscopic work, end up with some disaster. And so we look after those aspects also. The other area which is difficult for uh, a general surgeon because it requires special training is the liver and pancreatic work that we do. And we have these liver tumors and cysts and inflammatory conditions which are quite common. And we look after them uh, with state-of-the-art facilities that we have here. Uh, minimal invasive laparoscopic and many times radiology and the gastro and gastroenterology colleagues help us in managing these patients. Uh, sometimes we have a bleeding patient from somewhere uh, that is not amenable to be seen uh, by uh, upper GI or lower GI endoscopy. We explore these patients, do an enteroscopy on table, we call them up and they will show us the bleeder and then we can just uh, overrun it from the outside, and we have done a few cases like that and saved these patients. That's, so, that's yeah, that, that is remarkable because I think one of the things that uh, make SIUT fairly unique, and I think it's probably going to be a common theme in this conversation, is that you have everything under one roof. You have all the different specialties working in alignment with a good uh, uh, radiological and laboratory support uh, under one roof. So uh, again, I'm going to come back to the, the question that it is well known that SIUT takes care of perhaps the most complex uh, urological and transplant patients in the country, perhaps in the region. But again, in terms of gastrointestinal surgery and especially hepatobiliary surgery, which tends to be very costly maintaining those patients, taking care of those patients is very resource intensive. Is it, do you think it is, you could rightly claim that perhaps uh, SIUT is one of the busiest, if not the busiest center for these really complex patients in Karachi? Because there are many other hospitals that are doing their part, uh, both in private sector and public sector. There are some hospitals who have other unique models where they do some and take care of some patients uh, free of cost. But in terms of the volume and the scope, uh, is it right to say that SIUT perhaps is uh, your, your division in its, in its area is perhaps uh, the busiest? Yes, I would think so because uh, we are not a two o'clock hospital. So most hospitals in the public sector uh, stop working uh, complex cases uh, at 2 p.m. and so they cannot take over more than what can handle. And they do have a lot of general surgery. But these cases sometimes take uh, eight or 10 hours. And so uh, apart from training, uh, which is uh, not there in most cases in, general, in public hospitals in hepatobiliary work, uh, also the time, the anesthesia, and we are lucky to have anesthesia available 24 hours. So right. we are rush to do those cases so we take our time do it right mm -hmm. properly and so we are lucky that now we're getting more and more referrals from all over Sindh and Balochistan and lower Punjab so you know uh, we are kind of growing 
at the pace uh, that requires more space and uh, activity. Right. Yeah, yeah, you rightly said that outcomes matter. Right. Anybody can attempt a complex operation, but if you cannot see the patient safely through to the other end, then then really uh, it, it doesn't matter that much. So uh, kudos to you and your team that you're doing that. Uh, I have a... Uh, well, so in yes, private, sir. you know, what happens is these these operations are possible at Agha Khan or South City or other Zayaluddin. People run out of money. Right. You care in the post-operative period, so we end up taking care of their complications also. This is another... Oh, okay. So... so a people who can afford end up coming to us when their uh, money runs out. Right. So th this also uh, this is also needs to be highlighted because those patients have nowhere to go once yeah. their resources are exhausted. Uh, and we've all seen situations and heard stories of patients having spent you know the, the last penny that they have uh, and still require care uh, to be. And they put it place in a situation where, if if it was not for your unit, then they'd really be in a tough situation. So that that's also an important need that's being fulfilled. Uh, uh, Dr. Shakur, uh, if I may, I just had a question for yes. uh, Dr. Shirazi, and then maybe we yes. could uh, yes. go back to yeah. yeah. So, yes, uh, gee, uh, Dr. Bushra Shirazi, your uh, uh, a surgical oncologist, you're a colorectal surgeon, uh, uh, you do breast surgery, and of course, uh, you're involved in biomedical ethics. Uh, again, based on the same theme where SIUT is predominantly a kidney hospital in the minds of you know, general public, its supporters, its well-wishers, uh, providing complex cancer care, uh, colorectal care or breast care, it is laudable, but uh, some may argue that uh, SIUT you know, should just focus on its, its primary strength. And perhaps those patients who get taken care of uh, at SIUT for, say, breast cancer are being shortchanged because, well, it's a kidney hospital. Are they truly following international protocols or even national protocols? Are the patients getting their due? Is there education? Is there is there a tumor board, for example? How do you respond to those those challenge or those those those, those criticisms, uh, which which may not have any malice to them? They may just not know enough about how you operate. Uh, thank you very much for the question, and thank you for inviting at this forum. Uh, it, it is uh, very difficult for people to realize how the ambit of SIUT has changed. And if I take our mentor, Dr. Adib's uh, ethos a little forward, is he believes in the patient as a whole. So when you're talking about a patient, he, he would not look at a patient or the institute doesn't look at a patient only through the lens of one organ or one disease. They look at patients as a whole and as the requirements have increased with regards to uh, transplant patients developing cancers because of immunotherapies that they take or come up with core surgical issues or simple things like acute care that Dr. Abdal spoke about, you require expertise for that. And the transition of the Institute has been so in hiring people who are more qualified towards particular fields. And I think that is where the vision comes in of the Institute that as requirements have increased, uh, it has kind of spread its wings more. And I think in a country like Pakistan or even a city like Karachi, one institute cannot really take the burden. You keep trying and you keep, I mean, we're, uh, we're isolated amongst others because we provide free care with dignity and issues like transplant, issues like oncological care, we all know how expensive these are. So uh, the vision of the Institute to increase the ambit has been the need of the city, which 
I think we have always been prompt in delivering towards them. I mean, we can talk about that even during COVID times. I think we were one of the first institutions right. that had exactly. been set up. But coming back to it, uh, in the vision and the hiring and making sure uh, care is given, uh, which is of an international standards, is, uh, I mean, is on there. And I think people don't realize most of our patients, if not all, go through a tumor board. We have separate tumor boards for urology, for digestive care, for breast. So it is not that one person is doing anything on their whim. There is a complete science and discussion that goes also keeping in fact the social context, what applies to a given patient who maybe is coming from the interior. So I think that way we are unique in the way we practice and work. Thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful. Uh, Dr. Shakur. Yeah. So I wanted to ask um, Dr. Nasir Luck about the uh, actual GI services that SIUT provides. Obviously, SIUT is getting the reputation of being a fully comprehensive uh, gastrointestinal unit. In other words, uh, uh, all, uh, every conceivable procedure and diagnostic modality is undertaken. So, uh, Dr. Luck, can you tell us about the services that you provide uh, totally free of cost to the to the not only to the citizens of Karachi but to the region. Yeah, the model provided at SIUT is unique in a sense that the patients who are seen in the OPD department are being received by the gastroenterologist uh, along with the surgeons at the same time, as we already talked about, and uh, this team uh, then uh, see the patient in a collaboration. Uh, the laboratory services are there in the OPD department along with the ultrasound uh, services. The dietitians are available, vaccination booth is all there present. The patient has not to move anywhere uh, apart from just coming there and uh, uh, being seen by the doctors. In the inpatient department, the patients are uh, worked up uh, for procedures, investigations and the radiological uh, imaging or interventions, all consultation, including the cardiological uh, consultations, the pulmonology uh, consultation and anesthetists come to the ward themselves. They are available in the GI unit when they are called. And this ensures a streamlined process of obtaining any uh, coordinated activity. And there are no delays. Uh, if I would... Uh, further explain the services. So we can say that we have patient-directed and patient-oriented uh, management paradigm, uh, utilizing the personnel, uh, the technology, and uh, in a very cost-effective manner, which is tailor-made according to the patient problem. Thus, uh, in short, we say that we do things the SIUT way. Uh, the procedure which we provide uh, are, again, have a wide range of uh, endoscopic facilities in terms of uh, uh, the uh, observation of uh, problems of esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, uh, biliary system. And we have a uh, value addition, uh, the endoscopic ultrasound, which is rarely uh, there in the city, which we provide free of cost in the form of EUS, that is the ultrasound uh, from the stomach we do in these patients. Uh, so you are, uh, you are a totally uh, comprehensive, not only a diagnostic unit, but also uh, a fully uh, equipped therapeutic unit doing complex cases. In my visits to the SIUT, I had noticed that uh, you, were, you were doing emergency therapeutic cases after 2 p.m. when the other hospitals were shut down, including civil hospital, and, uh, and several other facilities. So, um, um, Dr. Abbas, uh, I'll, I, I wanted to ask you uh, about the services that you uh, provide uh, for the treatment of, um, of, of liver disease and uh, viral hepatitis being a big scourge in Pakistan, like all other developing countries. How have you made an impact uh, in the successful treatment 
of liver disease and the spectrum of liver cancer that you see secondary to viral hepatitis. Thank you, Dr. Shakur. Uh, yes, you are right. Uh, we have been seeing uh, the liver diseases in our OPDs. And uh, as you might be knowing that chronic liver disease is very common in Pakistan, particularly hepatitis B and hepatitis C. So the major chunk of the patients that we see in our OPD are those with suffering from viral hepatitis. We uh, diagnose them and treat them. And apart from the viral hepatitis, there are other causes of chronic liver disease as well that we see. And that includes the metabolic liver diseases like Wilson's disease, hemochromatosis, and others like autoimmune hepatitis, and uh, the polystatic liver disorders, the vascular liver disorders. We all address them and uh, manage them. And we uh, also, as you, as you rightly said, we are also looking after patients with hepatocellular carcinoma. The, our uh, hospital has the facility of uh, tr uh, providing trans-arterial chemoembolization. So we are happy to treat our patients with uh, uh, this facility. Besides those who are the candidates for surgery, we refer them to the surgeons after having ruling out uh, portal hypertension and they are happy to do the liver resection. Apart from uh, liver cancers, uh, there are other patients uh, like cholangiocarcinomas and uh, gallbladder carcinomas and they also affect the liver and they cause obstructive jaundice. And in these patients, what we do is that we provide them uh, the facility of ERCP and we place the stent, both uh, the plastic and the metallic stents. And if somehow if the procedure is not successful and uh, we, if the, we, we also facilitate many radiological procedures like percutaneous transhepatic cholangiography and stent placement. This, let me just remind you that uh, this facility is not widely available in our city and most of the patients that are being seen in the public sector, they are being referred to us. And uh, we, uh, we then admit them, we uh, take uh, opinion from our radiologists and provide the facility of PTC as well. Besides, uh, there are other diseases also like uh, the liver abscess. Patients uh, have been referred to us for liver abscess drainage, particularly the left lobe ones. And uh, this facility is again not widely available in the public sector. And then uh, we are also doing EUS. So endoscopic ultrasound has been a new addition uh, into our services. And those who are suffering from liver diseases like liver lesions, we take the biopsies and if there are, they are suffering from any cancers and if they are candidates for surgery, we do the staging using the EUS. Increasingly, the surgeons have grown, have taken interest and have, uh, we, have been, uh, um, we have been providing them the staging for these cancers and we have been uh, playing our role in making surgery easy for them. Besides, we also, we, we, as far as the liver diseases are concerned, uh, uh, there is one procedure that is the liver biopsy. And this is again, not uh, very widely available throughout the city. And uh, people are sort of afraid of uh, getting this investigation done just because they are afraid of the complications. Uh, we have been doing liver biopsies and have been diagnosing cases of chronic liver disease through the liver biopsy. And, uh, we diagnose the disease and help them manage these cases. Yes, and uh, can you can you uh, tell me about uh, the 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 volume of uh, therapeutic cases that you do, uh, and by endoscopic therapy I mean not only the the biliary pancreatic cases, but also um, uh, complex dilatations of the colon and the duodenum, et cetera, which are not being done elsewhere in the city and, uh, and, and how you work in conjunction with endoscopic ultrasound and how the surgeons are available at, at all times to see um, uh, the endoscopic therapy and if the surgical help is needed, uh, they're, they're there to provide it. Yes, uh, we, uh, our unit is one of the busiest units uh, uh, I'm not wrong, and uh, 
the number of endoscopic procedures that we do on monthly basis is approximately 450 cases to 500 cases. That becomes uh, a sum of about 5,000 cases in a year. Uh, among these, the major chunk is uh, the upper GI endoscopies, uh, that is the EGD, which is about 3,000 3, out of the total 5,000. Approximately 1,000 cases are those of the lower GI endoscopies, which include the sigmoidoscopy and the colonoscopies. Out of the remaining, we do approximately uh, 700 ERCPs in a year. And uh, with the addition of this endoscopic ultrasound, we, we have begun to do these cases over the last 2.5 years. And uh, we uh, do at, at least 300 cases of EUS in a year. So we are working together with the surgeons. Um, for example, if a case with uh, obstructive jaundice comes to us, for example, periampillary carcinoma or, or, or a disease like ours, uh, cancer in the head of the pancreas, we admit them, we provide the biliary drainage, we do the ERCP or the PTC, uh, we take the biopsy, and then, of course, uh, as is the beauty of this, uh, of this uh, institute, that it provides so many facilities under just one roof without the patient having to run from here and there. So we take the biopsy, the histopathologist provides the report at the earliest possible uh, duration, and then uh, the, his, the, the radiologist gives us his input and tells us about the, the, the stage of the disease. And then immediately, since uh, our ward also contains uh, the surgeons, so we can immediately refer the patients to the surgeons. And uh, so all this happens very quickly. The surgeons uh, then decide about the surgery, if they need any uh, assistance from the oncologist, the oncologist is available, uh, it's a one building apart. And uh, if the patient is candidate for neoadjuvant or adjuvant, uh, the, we also have the tumor board meetings in which we decide what services we have to provide to them. And if the patient is not a candidate for any of them, we have the radiation facility, radiation oncologist, and they, provide their services. So in, in collaboration with so many specialties, including the gastroenterologists, the surgeons, the histopathologists, the radiologists, oncologists, and at the time of the surgery, uh, specialties like hematologists and uh, anesthesiologists, we, we are able to provide so many facilities to a single patient and within one admission. Uh, Dr. Oh. Bas? Uh, yes. Dr. Shakur, I mean, so this is very complex, uh, high volume and expensive care. How much does it cost the patient? Uh, so, uh, the, I know the, the answer, but I just wanted to hear, is, uh, want to hear from you. Uh, thank you. The most important part of this, all this uh, facility is that the patient does not have to spend a single penny and he has he, he obtains all these services services completely free of cost and that too with dignity as is the motto of our institute we provide all these services irrespective of caste color and creed and that is free of cost with dignity thank you and uh, i know that dr rizvi wants to uh, ask dr shirazi about uh, cbac and the center for bioethics uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, but before I, I go to Dr. Shirazi, I just wanted to pick on something that Dr. Luck had said, uh, if I may yeah. ask Dr. Nasir Luck a question. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Nasir Luck, when you were responding to Dr. Shakur, I was listening intently, and uh, you used a phrase, the SIUT way. And uh, you know, growing up, all of us, of course, grew up in Pakistan. Some of us live in the West, but we travel back and forth. And growing up, the common understanding was that, well, most, uh, or if not all developments occur in the West. And then there are some solutions that are passed down from the developed countries to the less developed countries. Like you can call them hand-me-down solutions. And the less developed countries, other than providing raw material, have nothing else to contribute. But clearly, with the amount of work that has been done in the digestive disease unit at SIUT, and not to speak of the uh, nephrology, urology, and transplant sectors, uh, 
has there been any thought given to perhaps compiling the best practices at SIUT because they, uh, you function in a resource constrained environment and you achieve the same internationally comparable results at a fraction of the cost. Perhaps the time has come for SIUT to teach other institutions that are not as resource constrained a thing or two. Your thoughts on that or if anybody else from the panel wants to give an opinion on that. Like publishing the SIUT version of the Washington Manual of Medicine, for example, that people use, or some other manual. Uh, it's a very important question in terms of the functionality of any healthcare delivery system. Uh, SIUT has uh, developed a very unique environment in which there are no red tapism, no bureaucratic delays, there is no ego issues, and the patient is a center uh, for all those who are providing care to these patients. With an ambit of uh, recent guidelines, specialty-based, disease-based guidelines, which are being followed. And uh, uh, I feel pride in saying this, this, this culture and environment uh, has been created by a mentor and it is by being, uh, being taken into consideration by many young people who uh, are getting training here, who are working here, and they feel uh, very contented in uh, delivering uh, their all skills and uh, their uh, knowledge uh, just for the sake of services. And it's a service-based uh, environment in which the patient is getting, uh, without knowing that uh, what is being done for me, and uh, nobody can mention that uh, you have been taken care by so many people uh, so easily and uh, um, so elegantly. But again, uh, the patient uh, who is uh, again um, our uh, stakeholder, uh, they get all these uh, services uh, as a right, not as something that a favor is being given to him. So uh, on the both ends, I think uh, the ownership, uh, the people are uh, really developing and has developed with SIUT is remarkable. Again, uh, I would say that the SIUT model should be studied and uh, it should be implemented in resource uh, constrained countries around the world. And uh, uh, we are in a process of uh, writing the uh, manuals according to our uh, services, like we are in a process to write uh, a, a manual in which we do things uh, in a more easier way, uh, a very straightforward, uh, not cumbersome, uh, and uh, the practical approach towards patient care. And I think so your question is pertinent in terms that this is being carried out over the decades. And it's a very successful, uh, very user-friendly system and should be uh, replicated. So I'll, I'll take Dr. Shakur's cue and go to Dr. Shirazi, if I may. Uh, Dr. Busha Shirazi, uh, when I was a medical student and then a surgery resident, all we were told to emphasize on was you know, read your surgery texts and become as dexterous as you can in the operating room, learn new skills, never miss an operation, and just uh, learn to operate. And that's your job. So surgeons are by instinct uh, doers and they just work with their hands, right? What does a surgeon, or for that matter, any other doctor have to do with biomedical ethics? Isn't that for professors? I love the way you ask the question. Having said that, I think uh, as science has progressed, even the way medicine that is practiced has progressed in many ways. And so before I answer your direct question, I'd like to say that SIUT is the only institute in the whole of Pakistan that has a center 
for bioethics. So it's called CBEC, the Center of Bioethics and Culture. Now, times have changed because now uh, a surgeon is not only a surgeon. He is communicating with a variety of people. He is also a teacher. He is uh, he's a researcher. He wears multiple hats. And when somebody is wearing multiple hats, it's time that we stopped compartmentalizing things and bring it into one human being. So when we talk in Urdu, there's a word, ikhlaq, which is used for ethics, right? And it is something that we learn from all our homes. Now to tell a surgeon that you are only supposed to cut without understanding how someone uh, you should, I mean, you should speak to people in a particular may, way or understand what that person's problems are would be, in my opinion, uh, training someone not in a complete fashion. So I believe education, ethics, and uh, research are integral parts of the clinician today. And that is what is required today because having someone do research who's not a clinician doesn't work. Having a doctor who doesn't know how to speak to his patient or understand his patient or empathize with his patient is not the kind of doctor one would want to meet. So having said that and coming back to my center, which we are talking about over here, uh, it gives us pride to, uh, pride to say that it is the only center in Pakistan that is also in collaboration with the WHO. So in the Emerald region, we are one of the 11 centers that are associated with it. So that is also a feather in our cap at this institute. Great. Is it also true that this institution uh, has, uh, has attained uh, and rightly so, international fame and recognition, uh, and also the National Institute of Health uh, recognized the institution, and the institution was a recipient of an NIH grant to help train uh, train uh, physicians in Kenya. Yeah, so it is, uh, you're correct in your information, that is true. Uh, through this grant, our program is uh, unique in its sense. It's a hybrid of contact modules and distant learning, which makes it very pragmatic for mid-career professionals to join. So you can take a couple of weeks off and do a contact and then you are doing distant learning. Now through this program, people would go searching and through the SIUT website, there was a Kenyan student who applied and just found it pragmatic for her life. Uh, when she did the master's from uh, SIUT in bioethics, she was really fascinated by the whole process and the level of teaching and mentoring that took place. So she, in collaboration with Dr. Amir Jafri, who is at the center, uh, they made this NIH grant for trying to replicate our teaching methodology of ethics in Kenya. And that grant did get through and at present, uh, you know, we have a lot of Kenyan students coming. It has become international. We've had people come from uh, Kenya, Sri Lanka, you know, we having uh, people from Malaysia wanting to join our program. So it is, yes, becoming completely international at this level right now. Great. It's moving in a lovely direction, actually. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And for the viewers who do not know what NIH is, it's National Institute of Health. It is the premier uh, grant awarding institution in, in North America uh, and uh, uh, works closely with the federal government. So thank you. So, uh, do, uh, Dr. Farina Hanif, um, uh, I wanted to, um, uh, SIUT is known for postgraduate training. And so it's not only, a, it's not only a hospital for the benefit of the patients, but, but, uh, but in developing um, the skills and knowledge of healthcare professionals, 
uh, it's, a, it's, it's one of the major centers that is preparing uh, future doctors for postgraduate education after their medical school degrees. So um, I know that the gastroenterology, the digestive disease department is uh, heavily involved in postgraduate training. It can, doc, uh, Dr. Farina, can you tell me a little bit about uh, how you are training doctors for postgraduate education? Dr. Tariq, I'm afraid she, she's busy in seeing one of the serious patients. I will, okay. uh, I will try to answer this question. Okay. Uh, the academic mission of this department is again aligned uh, with the SIUT uh, philosophy of post-graduation training, which has really enhanced over, over the decades. And uh, what we can say that the, uh, our ambit is uh, education of the graduates and post-graduates at the same time. And we are being attracted by the FPS and MD students. Uh, the fellowship program is carefully designed like uh, to hone the consultative and management skills of uh, all those uh, junior consultants who want to become super specialists. Uh, this is just to mention that uh, the goal of our fellowship program is to produce independent uh, attending uh, in the gastroenterology and hepatology because we deal both the specialties uh, it is again cost effective for us and uh, we want them to acquire the leadership qualities, the managerial skills and uh, the trainees are uh, with us for about three years and the, this training program is again quite robust in the uh, research initiative. Although uh, we have uh, been training these doctors over the last many years. But one thing we have, we have seen is we take difficult uh, doctors to train, like doctors from uh, far flung areas. We uh, take a challenge to really make them uh, quality consultants to serve their own areas. As Professor Rizvi has, uh, 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 has ordered us to do this service to the community. This is the CSR of SIUT to the community. So we have uh, uh, additional in-house clinical fellowship uh, directed uh, programs like the transplant hepatology, the ERCP and EUS uh, training for all those who stay with us after the completion of training as we see in US. And uh, the other graduates of this program who has passed through the system are serving in uh, the in the country, various places, and they're working abroad as well. And uh, we are very happy that uh, we are producing quality gastroenterologists, hepatologists, who are really a resource for the community. So, um, uh, as uh, as uh, as I wanted to emphasize, uh, SIUT North America um, uh, is is heavily involved in uh, trying to help the SIUT in Karachi, and um, we've been. Uh, we 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 have uh, we we expend certain bit of energy in uh, raising funds, so uh, in that context, I'd like you and Dr. Abdal to to let us know and let the audience know uh, what are, are your plans for uh, future development and uh, and and growth in terms of uh, in terms of your uh, future needs for equipment and space and. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, because uh, Karachi, being a city of uh, close to 20 million people, has uh, unlimited needs for healthcare. And since you are probably the only one that is providing healthcare completely free uh, in these disciplines. Uh, I think that uh, our uh, patients are. Uh, increasing in exponential numbers over the years. Uh, there are various uh, factors for it, especially for those who can't afford uh, this expensive health care. So they are coming to us, no doubt. This is their right. The uh, second patient uh, referral and load is those who want to uh, get benefit of this uh, cutting edge technology. Uh, and this collaborative work which we're doing 
And I think so over uh, next few years, we will be needing more space, more equipment, and uh, a bigger team. I, I think so. Uh, this time is not uh, very far for us to expand more uh, what we have already achieved. So uh, lastly, um, I wanted to ask Dr. Heather about uh, uh, a follow-up question on postgraduate training. Uh, please tell us how you have sent uh, surgeons to Shiraz in Iran uh, to get postgraduate training and also how you have also sent physicians uh, sponsored by the SIUT to the university in Singapore. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. And uh, we have a collab collaboration with the uh, Shiraz team, uh, which is the biggest uh, transplant center in, uh, you can say, in the uh, whole of the uh, region. And uh, they are, uh, they have provided us all the hands uh, on as well. And they give us uh, fellowships in the tra transplant and he uh, hepatobiliary services. And so uh, uh, me and few uh, other colleagues were trained there. And uh, uh, they, they also help us in developing the uh, transplant center, uh, liver transplant center in, in SIUT. And we, with their help, we have done uh, 35 uh, liver transplants as well in uh, SIUT and with a good uh, output. Uh, so Dr. Rizvi, uh, you know, we here in the United States and at SIUT North America are always wondering how we can be um, of assistance to you in, the, in your Herculean task that you have been undertaking for most of your life. And that is why I asked a question of Dr. Luck about their plans for future expansion uh, of uh, digestive disease services and uh, how much um, uh, funds are required for the future. And SIUT uh, North America spends uh, a fair amount of their efforts and time at raising funds only to help you and your reputation of transparency and total trust that you have developed over the last 40 years is very helpful to us in raising funds to help the general cause of SIUT. So, uh, so can, you, can you tell us how, uh, and how we can help you in the future and if at all we have been helpful to you in the past? Actually, Tarek, uh, SIUT North America has been great help and has been great source of encouragement for me. And uh, last year, my Dr. Ahmad Saeed, and Mrs. Ahmad Saeed, they yes. were very vital in helping us. And uh, so far, the help is concerned. Uh, we are a bottomless pit. Or because uh, the number of the patients which we have got is increasing and will ever be increasing. Number of specialties are increasing and the diseases are also increasing. We have to keep pace with moving technology in order to combat this condition. So to give a fixed uh, amount of how much we need is very difficult because uh, already uh, SIP North America has given a lot of money to us. I think about six million dollars they have given so far with instrument and all those things. So we have they have given and let me tell you, it was their generosity that we opened our arm more and more and more and more. We expanded the services more and more. We invited patients more and more. And we went to the academia which uh, was quite far away from us at that time. And we have opened the school for nurses, a school for medical technologists. And uh, now we are trying running the PhD program and BS program uh, for the medical students as well. 
but this is uh, uh, not all that uh, is needed. What is needed is much more. And that is needed much more in the form of the supply of medicine, in the form of uh, providing the lab, which should be up to the mark, and we are uh, lagging behind in our lab facilities. We should have the training facilities where we can send our people to be trained outside uh, to come here, and we should have all the facilities to get the speakers from outside, teachers from our outside. For example, my concept is that the teachers from big universities, maybe English universities, uh, uh, this uh, Oxford, Cambridge, not Birmingham, or in England, from England, we should can get the speakers from various reputable centers. And for that particular subject, somebody who is coming, who is top physiologist, we should bring him. We should bring him for four to six weeks. We should keep him here and we should uh, advertise and uh, prepare our students much before and we should expose those students to these teachers. That is the best thing we can give. The same as surgeons, physicians, uh, basic scientists. We should bring all of them because our student cannot go. We can bring them. And yes. we have where we can keep them and they can be uh, actually with our uh, student for four to six weeks and people will stay there. So this is yes. what we can pass to our student. Yes. And, uh, and, but, I, <clears throat> but I also note that uh, you have had a reputation of holding international seminars and you have uh, you uh, you have the you have the reputation where international faculty has been visiting you periodically uh, and regularly uh, for the last uh, over 40 years so uh, <clears throat> and uh, we at uh, SUT North America are very keen to uh, to help and um, we we have uh, we have uh, individuals here who are trying to help, and you have uh, pinpointed some advisors from SIUT who have joined the board of SIUT North America, and it's uh, it's progressing uh, really well. And our um, the people here are quite generous, and they and the the, the level of fundraising has uh, thank God been going up on an annual basis. Actually, Tariq, I have to thank them again and again and again that it is the initiative from SIP North America and uh, the people who were uh, uh, all the time helping us, which actually gave us encouragement. And uh, we have expanded. Had it not been for the SIP North America, I don't think it was easy for us to expand so quickly and so nicely. So we are always indebted to SIP North America and the people who are there and the doctors from uh, North America, especially the, of the Indian and Pakistani origin. Yes. And that, that, by the way, encourages us to continue our efforts in this direction because the, the feedback that we get from you that our efforts are of some benefit to you. Therefore, it encourages us more and more to expand our efforts and reach out to more people. And this conversation today will uh, help us convey to people in this country uh, one of the small aspects of uh, SIUT. SIUT is much larger than what we could convey in this conversation.